So today, uh, we're going to continue this call, the Redemption Series. Remember, you guys have been uh, loved so much that God paid the ultimate price to have you back. He sacrificed his son. His son spilled his blood so that he would pay the price, the redemption price, to have you back. The wages of sin is death. We're all sinners. We have all fallen short. And so we all have a death penalty hanging over our head. And Jesus stepped in and took our place and paid our penalty because he wants you to have everlasting life with God. You have been forgiven. You have been cleansed. You've been washed. If you've put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, you are his. He's redeemed you. He's bought you back off the slave tables of sin. And he's made you his own son and daughter. And that is why we gather every week to give him praise and to encourage each other on this process called life. So uh, today I want to talk to you out of this passage, John chapter 21, about the, the topic of following directions. Following directions. Um, sometimes we, you know, take the wrong turn in life. We, we go the wrong way. Uh, I think it was August. Uh, our kids, uh, we do a summer reading program every summer where they read a whole bunch of books. And if they do the whole thing... They read all the books, they get the grand prize. And so we try to ch change it up every summer. And this summer's grand prize was? A trip to Oaks Park. A trip to Oaks Park. Okay, so they've never been, we've never been. So uh, if they read all the books, all three of them, uh, we'd all go as a family to, over to Oaks Park. And they did it. They always meet the grand prize. So they, they did it. And so we were able to go over there. And so we were... You know, looking around and standing in lines and doing this and that. But uh, they wanted to go on to the go-karts. And so we, we stood over there by the go-karts. And it took forever to get through the line. It was probably took like an hour. But finally, it was like the last ride of the day. And we wanted to get on the go-karts. So we're standing in the line. And it was right before we got on to the ride, we heard uh, all the directions. So there's lots of directions to make sure everybody was doing it right. And they, they told everybody, you know, to stay on the track, stay on the track, because there was like one road that took you kind of off, but it was a dead end. <laughs> and sure enough, somebody didn't listen to the directions and got off on the dead end road. And so the crew, you know, the maintenance crew had to go over there and get them readjusted. And it just took a long time to get the, the, the lady, I think it was, the lady back on the main road doing the things that she was supposed to do in the first place. But had she listened to the directions, that would have never happened. So aren't you glad that Jesus does that for us? Oftentimes he gives us directions and we don't follow. And we get ourselves off in some kind of dead-end road, and then we get stuck. And then so he comes to rescue us and to get us back on to the path that we're supposed to be traveling. So we're going to see this in our passage today as we look at this uh, uh, chapter 21. Uh, we're going to look at verses 1 through 14. And uh, if, you're thinking about it, th if you think about it, chapter 21 seems a little bit unnecessary. If you remember last week, chapter 20 is when Jesus appeared. He, he died, he was buried, he rose again, he was resurrected, bodily resurrected, and he comes and he appears. He makes his appearance and he says, hey, touch my hands, put your hand on my side, it's me. The same one who was nailed to the cross, speared in the side, it's me, I'm back. So he makes his big ta-da appearance, and then, uh, and, and then there's this nice little, you know, verses uh, 30 to 1 and 30, uh, 30 and 31, uh, kind of puts a bow on the whole thing, gives us a nice conclusion for the chapter, which feels like the end of the book. So why this? So this chapter here feels kind of like an epilogue. And, and that's really what it is. So the disciples, uh, if it just ended with chapter 20, you can have the premonition maybe that the disciples just like lived happily ever after. But you know, discipleship, is not like that. These guys have just begun the road for discipleship, but discipleship never ends that way. 
So you would think that these guys, after witnessing the resurrection, would be like sealed in perpetual sainthood. Don't you think? If Jesus appeared to you bodily, resurrect, don't you think that would be the end of the story? You'd forever be like this perfect saint? Well, Jesus comes along Side these guys in chapter 21, these blundering band of imperfect followers, and the process of discipleship has just begun. I love chapter 21 because it reminds me that after all the great miracles that they've seen, even the greatest of them all, meaning resurrection, we are all still a work in progress. The disciples are still. A work in progress. So uh, let's dive into this passage and uh, see what this chapter has to say to us today. As a blundering, bland, uh, uh, blundering, bland, blundering band of followers as we all are. Right? What does it have to say to us? So chapter 21, verse 1. After this, after Jesus revealed himself to all the disciples, Jesus revealed himself again. To the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples were together, seven in total. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, We will go with you. And they went out, they got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? And they answered him flatly, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for the work, and threw himself into the sea. Impulsive Peter, gotta love this guy. Pits on his coat, dives into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, about 100 yards off, but a football field's length. And when they got on to the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. So you know this guy was a pretty strong dude. A big fish would be two to three pounds. That's that 300, 400 pounds of net. He drags it to the shore. And although there were so many fish, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, verse 12, come and have some breakfast. And now... None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So, did they follow instructions? If you think about this, uh, last week we, we read in, in chapter 20, verse 21, uh, when Jesus first appeared to the disciples, chapter 20, verse 21 says this. He says, peace be with you. This is the first appearance. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he has said this, he breathed on them. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. So this was a commissioning service. 
the first time Jesus appears to them, he says, I have been sent my, for my father, and now I am sending you guys. The same way I was sent to you, I am sending you into the world. He breathes on them, commissions them for gospel ministry. And the first thing out of Peter's mouth was, so shall we go fishing, guys? It seemed like he, he didn't really get the gravity, the, 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 the weight of it all. That he was just going to go back to what they've always done. Go back to the typical. Go back to the normal. And take his job back at the fishing unit. And, and just go fishing. And everybody joins him. So the disciples go off on their own. And kind of do their own thing. And, and this, is, this is what they've done all their life. So this is all that they know. So, But as you read through this passage. You see that they do it all night long. Nothing. Not a fish. Not a catch. Not anything. They have labored all night and took nothing in all their labors. So it's not working. You ever been down, down a dead end road in life and you just figure out like this ain't working. Somewhere along the line I have uh, not listened closely enough, and all of a sudden, I feel like I'm just spinning wheels. Anything I do, I've been going at this like all night long, and not a thing. I remember uh, when I was 19 years old. Uh, so I got done with uh, high school at 18, and so I went to a junior college for a couple years, and uh, because I wanted to go off to Washington State University. But I, I was going to do the two years. But I felt like I got done with the first year. And my life wasn't really going on that well spiritually. You know, I didn't have a lot of Christian friends. And, and things weren't really, you know, I, I felt like I was really kind of in, stuck in a rut. And the harder I would try to live for the Lord, the, the, the worse I would get. <laughs> you know, I, I would like swim hard into the Lord. And it was like a pendulum. Is the hardest I would swing into the Lord is the, the hardest I, I would go into the ways of the world. I'm doing all kinds of stuff I've never done before, getting in all kinds of stuff. And I felt like at the end of that first year of junior college that I was supposed to like go. I was supposed to go to college. Go, I was supposed to go to Pullman. And I felt like, I, you, know, was, you know, I got cold feet. It's like, I, no, I'll just stay another year and... That year, my 19th year, was probably my worst I'd ever lived. Doing some really stuff that I knew I wasn't uh, proud of, God wasn't proud of, and I was getting into all kinds of sin. And I felt like I, has, uh, I, I had missed the direction, and I spent a year just kind of on that dead-end road to the maintenance crew and came and got me. Jesus came and got me and got me back on, on, on the right path. Again, I remember when I was like 35, you know, I felt like, again, I was supposed to transition in my life and do something different. And I had other people kind of talking in my life. Hey, it's like, it's time for you to do this thing, man. And I, I know, I know. And I uh, just had a job and I just, I had a couple kids. We just gotten our second child and I felt like, again, I was, I was comfortable. I was in, in a groove and again, I was starting to feel like, you know, God was pushing me out of the womb. <laughs> we get comfortable in life sometimes. And I think it's not until God starts to put the squeeze on that we, 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 we heed the direction and, and go in the way he wants us to go. But sometimes we need to realize, hey, you know, I'm on a road right now. Whatever I'm doing, it's not working. He's been talking to me. And I've been ignoring him. So what do you do when you find that you're stuck? When you're in a, in a holding pattern? What do you do when you feel like you're in a dead end and, and, and just know, you know, this, this, for some reason, this is not working. They toiled all night, these guys do. And they took nothing. What do you do? Well, from the text, if you look at verse 5. Jesus said to them, children, not like he needed to know the answer to this question, but he says, children, do you have any fish? And how's that working for you? Uh, it's not. 
We haven't taken anything all night. So I think the number one thing here is to admit defeat. When you're stuck in life, and you're on a pattern that's not going anywhere, and you know you haven't been following the directions that God has been trying to give to you, I think the first step you need to take is admit that you have a problem. And sometimes that is so hard to do. They say, if you are suffering an addiction, the first thing you need to do is admit that you have a problem. Oh, no, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have a problem. I'm, I, got, I got it under, under control, you know. I think you might be having like a drinking problem. No, I, no I, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I, I have control over this thing. You know, that person is not ready to receive help. I think uh, the first task in any person's life is to be able, if, if you want to grow, you got to be able to define reality. And if you aren't able to define reality, then you're not, you, if you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going. So the first step in determining where you're going is determine where you are. I've got a problem in my life. I'm stuck. This ain't working. And so I think we need to be dedicated to the truth. And this requires self-examination. Hello? You guys are all so quiet. Self-awareness. Where are you? And sometimes you can get yourself lost so badly when you, you haven't spent any time to reflect. Any time to take inventory. Where am I in life? Am I willing to be honest with myself? And even honest with those people around me who love me? Who, who might be saying some things into my life? I, I need to be able to be real, honest, and brutal with reality. Yes? I'm stuck. I'm not, I'm not making any progress in my life. So this requires honesty and humility. That's step number one. So what do you do when you get stuck, when, you, when, you're, uh, when you're on a dead end road? Number one, admit defeat. Number two, listen afresh. Look at verse 6 in our text, John chapter 21. So number one, admit. Number two, listen. Listen afresh. So the question is, how do you do that? God's trying to talk to you. He's trying to communicate a message to you. How do you listen to, how do you hear from God? God talks to you. God speaks to you. I believe he is all the time. Now, he doesn't talk to us like we talk to each other audibly. Sometimes he talks to our heart. But I believe our heart is wired up with an antenna that we can actually receive the message. Do you know that radio waves are going through this room right now? And we're not able to pick it up because we don't have the right receiver. But we have a heart that is receptive. That's, we are wired up to communicate with God. So when we get back in touch with God, we can get back in touch with this ability to listen to him. So the question is, how do you do that? I think number one is spend time in his word. If you want to get to know his voice, you got to, if you want to get to know his uh, voice, you got, to get, you got to get to know his word. He's spoken. And, and so to get acquainted with somebody's voice, you got to listen to them talk. So read the word. And you'll start to detect the way, the patterns, the thought patterns, the way he talks and communicates. His tone of voice comes through so well in the Bible. So if you want to learn how to hear from God, listen to his word on a regular basis. My sheep know my voice. And so as his sheep, he's the shepherd of the sheep. He's, he's the leader of his people. We've got to spend time listening. And if we don't listen, 
If we don't spend time listening to his word, we don't know what his voice sounds like. So the number one thing there is listen to his word. And then I would also say uh, listen to his voice. He doesn't just speak here. I, I think he does speak to you. This speaks to all people all time. But his voice speaks to you, this people, in this time. He wants to specify his, his directions in your life. He, he's speaking to you. He, he has a voice, and he's using it. And I like to call it the, the God nudge. You guys ever have like a nudge? Like he's prompting you, right? He doesn't ever like push you. I guess he can. Sometimes he pushes you. Oftentimes, though, he doesn't push. He prompts. He pokes. He elbows you. It's these, it's these little nudges that come as little reminders and little thoughts, re- recurring thoughts that come. And, and uh, sometimes he, he uh, repeats himself, you know. There's themes that emerge from your, your walks in nature. And somebody that talks to you, you, you listen to a word and, and you, you have a friend that says something and just kind of keeps popping back up. These recurring thoughts. Don't leave you alone. I think that's the voice of God. Now, you need to take his voice and test it with the word to make sure, hey, does this align with what he's always said? Because if it's out of, of sync with what he's always said, then you can probably dismiss it. Because the Bible says, test the spirits. It's not just the Holy Spirit out there. There's other spirits out there that try to deceive and trick. And, and so if you know his word, then you can recognize his voice when he speaks. And he's always talking. God is always talking. And he does it soft. He has a soft, still voice. So we need to train our hearts to listen and to listen afresh. Number one thing is when you're stuck in life, you got to admit that you have a problem. The number two thing is you, you got to listen afresh. He's always giving you instructions. He cares about your life down to the details of your life. Sometimes I think sometimes he says, hey, I want you to take a right on this road because there is an accident waiting up ahead. Sometimes you don't always know what he's directed you to, but sometimes pay attention to the God nudge. Don't ignore it. He's trying to communicate with you. He loves you. This is who God is, right? So don't poo-poo anything he's trying to say. Take it into account. Pray about it. Lord, is this you? Do you want me to act upon this? And he will give your heart clearance. Yes. Or wait on that. Or whatever. Okay? Because he cares about the details of our life. So number one, admit admit defeat. Admit you have a problem. I'm stuck. Number two, listen. Perk back up. I've neglected, I've ignored. Now I'm not going to do that. I'm going to pay attention. You got my full attention, Lord. Speak. I love when little Samuel, when in the Old Testament, you know, he, he's coming. It's like, man, I, I feel like you're calling me. You know, Eli, are you calling me? No, no, that must be the Lord. I want you, Samuel, to go back and say, Lord, here I am. Speak. I, I am your servant. I'm ready to do your will. Speak, Lord. And the next time he heard his name, he says, here I am, Lord. I am your servant. Speak. So sometimes you got to make yourself available. We get so busy, right? Go, go, go. Do, 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 do. And we never take the time to get in his presence and just, Lord, I'm your servant. Please speak to me. I'm available. Sometimes I've been going on these walks. All right, go on, go on, on. All day long. I mean, not, not all day. Every day. Uh, in the morning, I go on like maybe a two to three mile walk. And that's part of my walk time. I go out there and I look. I'm out there like in receptive mode. Lord, I am here. I want to make myself available to you. And I don't bring my headphones to listen to music or listen to iP- iPods or what, what is it? Not iPods. Uh, podcasts. Right? We, 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 we get like, you know, podcasts crazy. Just always listening to something. Turn it off <laughs> once in a while. 
Dial in to God. Make yourself available. Allow him to speak to your heart. Listen afresh. So admit defeat. Uh, listen afresh. Number three is uh, do what he says. If you look at the, uh, the passage here. He said, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. Make yourself available. Ask the Lord, what are you saying in my life? And then do it. Do it. Obey. See what happens. Call that person. Check on that thing. Try one more time. Stop doing this. Start doing that. Obey. Just see what happens. He's speaking to you. I made myself available. And then, therefore, I'm going to just do it. You know, the other day I got back from my, my walk. And, and somebody, God put somebody on my heart. And out of the blue, I just called them. And they said, oh, that's so funny you called me. I was just about to call you. And I didn't. And they went on to tell me something that was, had happened to them that morning. And I said, well, here I am. Because I just listened and obeyed. And it actually worked out. And it served as kind of a, a confirmation that God had their number. God knew what was happening that morning. Here I, out of nowhere, just show up. And God likes to do that stuff every single day. Every day is like an adventure. Wake up in the morning and say, how do you want to use me today, Lord? You know, he's not stuck in some book up on some shelf. He's not some God of history, although he is. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So let's pull him off the shelf and actually get acquainted. This is called relationship. This is called living a, a, a living hope, a living faith. It's not just some intellectual exercise. Now, this is actually real. He's talking. So listen and obey. The God nudge makes life an adventure. I'm ready, Lord. Do as you want, and I will obey. So what projects have you been working on? And seem to be getting nowhere. What financial goals are you striving towards and, and just not making? What, what emotions are you sorting through in life and you feel like you're just stuck? What, what conflicts are you, have you been battling and, and not really making any headway? I think this is a message for anybody who feels like they're just going in circles and I need a breakthrough. You got to start at the beginning. You got to admit, man, I've got a situation going on here. I've got a problem. I've been defeated. I've disobeyed. I've, been on the, I've gone down the wrong road and I knew it was the wrong road. I, now I'm stuck. If you can't do that, you can't move forward. Number one thing is to admit defeat. Number two is to listen afresh. He's not going to punish you. He's not going to give you the silent treatment. He's always talking, and it always starts with the words, I love you. We're going to do this thing. I'm going to get you back on your feet. We're going to get you going in the right direction. He's never going to hammer you over the head. He's always he's on the edge of his seat, arms open. Let's do this thing. Let's get, let's get going on the right track. I, I got a hope and a future for your life. So listen afresh, and then... Dare to believe and do what he says. That's the way to get right on the right track. So my encouragement from this passage is watch for the dawn. The, the night sometimes is long. If you look at this passage, that's exactly what happened here. It says here in verse 4, just as the day was breaking. They've been going at this all night long. And whatever you're facing... This afternoon, it might be 
It might have been a long night for you. But the dawn is coming. And guess who's on the shore? Jesus. He's going to see you through. He's going he's to lead the boat. He's going he's to do some stuff in your life. He's going to blow your mind. And sometimes the night seems long, but the day always dawns. Jesus is always on the shore. He's not giving up on you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He's going to guide you home. But we need miracles. And we shouldn't be ashamed of, of saying that we do. That's, that's the reason that we got a testimony. We got stories to share and to tell and, and to it, amazing things. Uh, great and small, I don't care. We need God to show up and do the things that only He can do. We can do our part. God has to do His. And I'm going to say today that there is a great need for miracles in this room. We need stories to tell. We need fresh encounters. We need experiences. And never forget what Ephesians 3 says. God is able. Say that. God is able. God is able. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than all that we ask or think. Why would God tell us that? He says, I am able to do more than you ask. I am more able to do more than you think. Why? I think he's trying to tantalize us. Ask big. Think big. I can do more. I can do greater. I am able. So that's the God we talk to. That's the God we serve. That's the God we listen to. A God who is able. He could do it. Think big. Dream big. Push yourself. Stretch yourself. Get wild and crazy with your ideas and thoughts. And God, you're able to do this. Claw into God and hold on to Him for dear life. You're able. This is a deep, dark pit I'm in, but you're able to pull me out. I've been on this road for so long, I don't know what else to do. You're able to get me right. We serve a God who is able. That's the God we serve. So, what puts us in the best position to experience this? I think we need to admit defeat, listen afresh, do what he says. And when we find out it's the Lord, when he does the miracle in our life, it's like, oh, 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 that was God. Nobody else could have done that. that. That had to be Jesus. Jesus. I mean, that's what they did. That's Peter. You know, John goes, I think that, that's Jesus. You know, they got this big thing that just happened. We, that didn't count. I mean, who else could do that? I mean, seriously. When God answers your prayers like, oh, my God. And, 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 and Peter, once he find out what, finds out what's Jesus, it's, he's so funny. He puts on his coat of all things. I mean, he's already stripped down. You don't put on your coat to go swimming, right? But he was so excited. He, he put on his coat, headed for the door, do, dove into the sea to go and get Jesus. I mean, he was so excited. They, they made a beeline for the shore. And it's kind of interesting. If you think about it, uh, they didn't know it was him. 
but they knew it was him. Sometimes I think that that's how prayer works sometimes. Like, I didn't, you know, that answer came about pretty awesomely, but, but I don't know if that's God or not, but I think that's God. I, I'm not sure if that was, but, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. That's the place that we are in in this world. These guys walked with Jesus. They can't, now, can't recognize him in, in this state. And I think that's starting to be our experience today as believers, that we don't always know it's God. We don't want to write the prayer away and think, oh, that would have already happened had I not prayed. But it actually happened. And they said, uh, we don't know it's him, but we, we know it's him. I think it's interesting. So sometimes I think in this chapter, uh, in this passage, uh, uh, we need to admit that we have a problem and seek realignment. Sometimes we get out of, out of whack. I'm on a dead end. This isn't working. We're stuck. We need Jesus to show up. Come to this point that I am nothing without you. And I'm going to listen and I'm going to obey whether there's a miracle or not. And did you notice that the miracle really didn't hold their attention very long? They got the miracle, 153 fish, boom, right to Jesus. I mean, they left the miracle on the boat. I mean, the miracle was back there, and they just dragged, and Jesus said, hey, are you guys going to bring the fish that you just caught? I mean, he had to remind them of the miracle. They didn't care about the miracle. The miracle was a sign that Jesus was present. And the miracle didn't last but what, three or four days? Miracles don't last forever, guys. Miracles are great, but they always bring us to Jesus, the source of miracles. And I don't, I don't care about miracles. Miracles can come and miracles can go and miracles won't last. But miracles always say Jesus is in the room. He's in my life. He's not giving up on me. And so that's the thing that, that brings us back to fellowship with him. The thing that meant everything to them, I think, was the fact that Jesus was on the shore and he invited them to come have some breakfast. They invited him to, to, to come have a meal. Share a meal with me. Come and share a meal. And so we're going to finish our time uh, doing that. If you look at verse 12, uh, does, every, does everybody have the bread and the juice? If you don't, why don't you raise your hand? Okay, why don't you carry that around? My son, Mr. Elijah will come and see you. So lift your hand high. If you like the bread and the juice, we're going to take a meal together. Call the Lord's Supper.